I got my fair brunt of criticism. And that's when I started taking martial arts more seriously. But this is how we learned. That was kind of the wild west of the internet back then. Which... How are you? What's happening? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 422. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Eric Jacobus. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show, the founder of Whistlekick. And I love the martial arts. Love everything about martial arts. I love the people who do martial arts. I love the movements. I love how it helps people grow. I love the stuff. I love uniforms and belts and sparring gear. And that's probably why I started a company that, at least in part, makes that stuff. And if you head on over to whistlekick.com, you can find all the stuff that we make. Now, we make a lot of products, but we also have a number of other projects that we're involved in. And you can find links to all of those from Marshall Journal to the other sites. I mean, there's, there's a bunch. I'm not going to give you a list. If you go to whistlekick.com, you'll see everything we got going on. If you, you make a purchase in the store, use the code PODCAST15. Saves you 15% on everything that we do. And you can sign up for the newsletter too. Keep you informed of what we're doing. Now, if you want to know more about the podcast, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. You can find all of the episodes we've ever done. Photos, videos, links, the whole shebang over there. So check it out. We bring you two shows a week. And really the goal is just to help you explore and enjoy your martial arts lifestyle, as someone recently called it. So enjoy. Now on today's show, we bring you someone who has a slightly atypical story. You know, this is not the story that you're going to hear from most of the guests on the show. But what I like about it is that I think we can all find a little bit of ourselves in this story. It's a story of perseverance. I mean, really, that's the word that jumps out at me. And I think you're going to enjoy it. At least if I was a betting man, I'd put a bunch of money on it. So here we go. Here's my conversation with Mr. Eric Jacobus. Mr. Jacobus, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. You know, you, we, we almost didn't have this, right? This is what, our, our third reschedule and i don't want listeners to think that that's like i'm saying that in a negative way just every once in a while we end up with a with an episode that seems to be a little cursed <laughs> <laughs> and this one this one when I, when I saw my schedule for the board again i saw your name i was like oh fingers crossed fingers crossed let's not reschedule again because I, I think once it was me i think i was dying i think i was sick and then it was and then i think once it was you and i felt better about that because then we were even exactly <laughs> we made it happen but we made it happen we're here and and you know barring a tyrannosaurus busting through the roof and eating me mm -hmm. i think we'll be good to go mm -hmm. so um yeah let's let's talk martial arts let's talk about right. you know this this whole this whole thing that we we all do all the listeners do it's called martial arts radio and, and so we try to start with with martial arts so how did you find martial arts you know I think the first martial art fight scene I saw was from the Pink Panther. Really? Okay, that that's a new response. And that was, yeah, when, that you know, that's before. back when you did judo chops, and uh, you know, it was just just around the Bruce Lee era, you know. But these were uh, American movies, you know, the one I watched a lot as a kid was Return of the Pink Panther, and uh, you know, the, my first martial art fight scene was a comedy. Mm -hmm. Those Pink Panther fight scenes are genius and how they integrate you know, the fight scene with the environment. And they're, they're, they're just fantastically done because it was like the jokes never failed in those scenes. And I think that from that, it was a natural transition to get into Jackie Chan heavily when I was in my teen. I was in a small town in the, called Redding in Northern California. And we really didn't have much in the way of martial art movies, Asian martial art movies. And so we had a handful at our movie store, but uh, not a whole lot. And once Jackie Chan started coming into theaters with Romo in the Bronx and Mr. Nice Guy, which was kind of late in his career at the time, he had had 15 years of making other Hong Kong action movies. I started researching him and watching everything. And then I started watching everything Samuel Hong did and then everybody associated with them. And, and I had taken some martial arts as a kid. Uh, not a whole lot. It wasn't really interesting to me at the time. I'd taken some karate. And, uh, 
you know, that's when I was 12 or so, did some gymnastics. So I was a physical kid, but by no means a master. And then in my late teens, when I rediscovered martial arts through Jackie Chan, I really got interested in not only doing martial arts, but making martial art movies. Mm. Now, how did you get from, from one to the next? I mean, a lot of people watch martial arts movies and maybe a good portion of us, maybe, maybe even most of us fantasize about what it would be like to do martial arts in a movie. But I don't think too many people actually sit down and say, you know, this is something I want to do. So what was it about that for you? Well, when I was watching all these martial art movies, um, I kept on running into the issue of researching martial art movies and trying to find out which ones had the best fight scenes. Now, if you transport yourself back in time to 1998, the internet didn't have a whole lot going on. There was Fortune City, GeoCities, there were these small websites. There were, you know, Yahoo was the main search engine or Alta Vista. And you would try and research, you know, Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung movies, and there just wasn't a whole lot out there. And there were a few sites that reviewed the movies, but never anything reviewing the action. And so when I started actually going into Chinatown and just taking gambles on, you know, I'd buy stacks of video CDs because I'd travel down to Chinatown, which is like a, you know, be an eight hour round trip. And I'd do it on a Friday night and I'd just spend all the money that I earned from my job at the time. And I'd bring back a stack of video CDs, DVDs, and I would just watch them. And then I started, I was actually a techie at the time. I was making websites and programming in Visual Basic and PHP. I was 16. I was doing this at a community college in Reading. And I knew how to make a website. So I said, well, why don't I, why don't I just review the action in all these movies I'm watching? And so that's exactly what I did. So over the course of about three years, I compiled 500 movie reviews of, you know, very mainstream Hong Kong action films and very, very obscure ones, you know. And I was watching Donnie Yen stuff that nobody really saw at the time. And, and I went to Hong Kong, got a bunch of video CDs and DVD, got a whole suitcase full of them, brought them back and reviewed every one of them. And after doing this for three years, after reviewing just fight scenes for three years, and because I had had a little bit of martial art training myself, I started understanding how they were made because I would just watch them constantly, watch these fights on repeat. And reviewing them kind of helped me figure out why uh, things worked, why things didn't work, how the camera worked, how editing worked. That was my filmmaking class, I was reviewing martial art action films, Hong Kong action films primarily. Uh, at the time, I did a couple Korean action movie reviews, but really Korea wasn't taken off as a martial art market until the late 90s, Shiri. And, uh, and so once I realized that it's a fairly straightforward process to pick up a camera, and plus at the time, digital filmmaking was actually affordable. In the, you know, this is around 2000, 2001, I uh, realized that you could get a capture card and then just film something, plug it into the capture card, put it into some free video editing software that came with the capture card, edit that thing, put it online, make a forum, get a bunch of feedback, repeat. And that's exactly what we did. And we started a group called the Stump People. We made a, a short, short garbage martial arts film as our, as our first one out. And, you know, the first year we made, we made like 35 short films and they're all just trying to we were just trying to make fight scenes you know we got sound we found sound effects now rip sound effects from other movies uh in our forum you know we ended up share i ended up sharing a lot of those sound effects and then these guys around the world from you know like like Ulrich and germany and then you know you had a guy in japan you had a guy in Hong Kong, there's a guy in turkey uh and then guys in la they start kind of springing up these guys in chicago start springing up and saying hey um you know, we're really interested in doing this stuff too. And they kind of had the same idea. And so we started sharing sound effects and they would rip sound effects from some movies and we'd share them. And it became this kind of underground, uh, I don't know, like a, like a trade, like a, like a market of where we were just sharing all this stuff. We were also sharing information about, you know, what are the best camera angles for certain kicks? Is that Bruce Lee did it? Is that Jackie Chan did it? Is that we did it? Um, this way doesn't work. Here's why. Here's this editing technique. And we were, and we would put our videos up online for years and there was no YouTube back then. So you had to get FTP space from your school, from a friend who had a website or something. I, I had a buddy who had made the, the direct connect program. He gave me, you know, John Hesse gave me a bunch of, uh, 
free web space and I ended up putting stuff on there. And you know, when you would watch a movie, you download a video clip and we would, uh, we would give each other very, very honest feedback. I mean, if your movie sucked, you were going to hear about it. You know, if your fight scene was no good, if your martial arts are no good, somebody was going to tell you, somebody's going to say, dude, your kicks are terrible. And I, and I, I got my fair brunt of criticism. And that's when I started taking martial arts a little more seriously. But this is how we learned. That was kind of the wild west of the internet back then, which is that you know nobody was afraid of hate mail. Nobody was afraid of hateful comments. It was like it was, a comment was a comment. You either took it or you didn't. And I found that the most helpful comments a lot of the time were the very critical ones. There were people that were honest enough with me to, honest enough to actually help me get better. Hmm. Now, what was the end goal? I mean, it- just the way you're talking about it, I imagine it was fun. I imagine you got to work with people that you enjoyed working with. But was it just an all-encompassing hobby or were you trying to f- turn it into something more? I think we all kind of were looking at the Hong Kong industry, which was, you know, you're in post-handover Hong Kong at this point. So this is after 97. And really, martial art movies in Hong Kong had taken a big hit at the time. Uh, I think around 1995, after that, there wasn't a whole lot of martial art movies going on. I think a lot of us felt like we were trying to carry the torch. You know, and the, the Matrix was an example of the torch being carried into America, right? Because, I mean, this literally what is what happened, though, is a lot of those Hong Kong filmmakers and stars, like Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, Michelle Yeoh, Yu Mo Ping, Jet Li, Corey Yoon, they all came to the, to the U.S. after 1997. You know, you got Jet Li with Lethal Weapon 4, Jackie Chan doing Rush Hour, uh, Sam Hong doing martial law and Yu Wu Ping doing The Matrix with Chaz Stahelski. And Chaz Stahelski is Keanu's double at the time. And he, he ended up making John Wick 20 years later. And, <clears throat> you know, you saw, you, see, you, look, you look at The Matrix and it's like, that is the torch being handed over. Uh, seeing the Hong Kong action style coming perfectly into the, into the American audience. And, you know, all of us on the sidelines are going, we would love to do something like that, but we don't have the money. We're going to fail the auditions. We're nowhere near Hollywood. Hollywood, right? I wasn't able to move down to Hollywood at the time. I just had no idea what I was doing. And I, you know, a lot of the, you know, the people doing the auditions in Hollywood were martial art experts and we were not experts. We could make films, but we were not martial art experts. We could not ace an audition. We knew that. So we had to be pragmatic about it. And we said, okay, well, let's just work on the outside, kind of work in this indie world and see what we can do with the goal of turning martial art action filmmaking or media making in general, because, you know, like you said, so we, we're probably going to get into games in this conversation too and try and make that into a career. We had no idea how we, how we would get there. No idea. Well, that's, we, there was, we, there was faith that it might happen. Yeah. We had, yeah, well, we, we had our sight, we had our sights on it on something. Okay. And did you, did you have conversations with the others in this group? Or did you, did you sit down over, you know, food or beer or something and say, you know, this is, this is something that we can do. We can make this happen. Or was it more a, a Hail Mary? And that's, 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 that's the tough thing is that on the one hand, uh, you, you look like, it, it looks like the world is kind of growing around you and you, you keep on making these really short, low budget action films off to the side and the, you know, the rest of the world is speeding forward. Um, and then also, you know, when, when September 11th happened, it seemed like uh, uh, the action language really changed an identity, you know? So there was kind of this concerted shift away from showing action in the kind of matrix traditional, uh, uh, you know, tripod, dolly, very clear movement, clear lines. And it went into this very, well, if you think about what 9-11 did, um, to action, and you think about how people then perceived violence, while well, people saw violence as random and lawless. So you had to have a hero that could carry that forward with, with Jason Bourne in 2002 and the Bourne Identity. And a lot of us were looking at Bourne Identity going like, man, I mean, that you can't see the action, you can't see the martial arts. We really wanted to kind of keep doing the Hong Kong style. And we just, and it was obviously not happening for a long time in Hollywood. And yeah, they were doing some wire martial art movies, but none of them really took off. Uh, yeah, there was some stuff in China, but none of us really wanted to move to China. You know, a few of us did, but you know, like I, I stuck around, a lot of us stuck around kind of hoping that, that 
the, the Hong Kong style could come back someday. And eventually it did, but, you know, we were doing this. I was doing that for about 15 years, doing day jobs on the side before I became a full-time stuntman. 15 years. Yeah, that's, that's a long time yeah. to pursue a goal. Now, through that time, I imagine that you're doing more than training and making these films on your own. Are, are you are you taking classes? Are you trying to make connections? Something tells me the story is a little more complex. Well, I went to film school, and around the same time I went to film school when I was 20, uh, I started taking martial arts very seriously at that point. So uh, I moved to San Francisco, opened up a phone book, went to the martial arts section, and just went down the line. Uh, the second school I called was a Taekwondo school, so I started in Taekwondo. And again, I'd had karate experience and I'd had the experience of doing martial arts and movies nonstop for two years. So I came in actually armed with enough skills to advance fairly quickly in Taekwondo. And I didn't, I, I can learn pretty quickly. You know, I would, I can throw away old habits and learn new habits pretty quickly. <clears throat> so that wasn't really an issue. It's not like my years of doing martial art movies caused some kind of stumbling block where I was going to have bad form forever. But, um, you know, and after Taekwondo, I started taking Hapkido, uh, a much more like MMA style of Hapkido with a lot more kicks, a lot more punches, a lot more grappling. And so during that whole time of, you know, making indie films, I'm learning martial arts from a lot of the guys in the stunt team. They're teaching me, you know, we're, you know, I'm going to their martial art classes and, you know, Wednesday night we had open sparring. So a bunch of people would come in, I'd spar random people. Uh, got to, and I would spar my buddies too, because we, that's how we learned each other's timing. You know, Dennis rule and I, we, we would spar a fair amount and, you know, we, we beat each other up a little bit, you know, and I do that with a bunch of the guys in the team. And it was scary because they were all way better than me, but I had to get in there and learn how to fight because, you know, I, I knew that if I really wanted to be convincing on camera and actually hold a candle to these guys, I had to be able to fight. And so I'd fight them. <laughs> so we'd fight. And what that ended up doing is uh, our timing got so good and we could go really quick. We could almost go Hong Kong speed without, without having to speed the camera up. You know what I mean? Mm. And so that process of learning martial arts along with the process of filmmaking uh, was, was kind of uh, nourishing us and enriching us for, for what was to come. Okay. And so, how did it change? Where where was the break? Did it did it happen overnight or did you start getting little stuff? No, it, it was such a slow, slow process. I mean, we we made a few feature martial art films. Um, we made three. One was called Contour, another was called Immortal, and another one was called Death Grip. And I produced those. Uh, Contour was a five thousand dollar movie we shot in a warehouse. You know, we just wanted to make a Hong Kong style action movie. I think to this day, like that's one that people still remember the most because it was just pure action. And we, you know, we had been working together as a team for a few years and we just kind of had our, it had our rhythm figured out and we just went and made this movie. It took us a year to make it. Um, and then after that, it, you know, it was another, another slump. Um, it was more day jobs. It was more chasing random Hollywood gigs. Whenever I could, I would get brought on to do very tiny things like music videos, you know, and we'd be the stunt team on the music video. Uh, in 2011, I raised $110,000 to do another feature film called Death Grip. Movie was, you know, was a financial failure, uh, but the learning process was huge with that. And again, another slump, <laughs> right? I wasted, blew my life savings on that movie, and it was a total slump after that. And again, going back to day jobs, um, Clayton, I, Clayton Barber, who's a, a well-known stunt coordinator in, in Hollywood, he did you know, Creed, he worked on Black Panther. He, he, he found me and he said, uh, hey, let's do a short film together. And we did Rope It Up. And it was his idea to do a Groundhog Day with martial arts. And that's when things started picking up a little bit. And, you know, I, I kind of gave, gave up a lot of control at that point because I had done Death Grip. I had worn every hat for that movie and it was exhausting. And <clears throat> it kind of run me down and humbled me. And so then, you know, working with Clayton, working with other directors, started doing more short films. Things started taking a, a, a slight turn at that point. And then I started getting a few more jobs in, um, in Hollywood uh, because I was open to working as, you know, a camera operator for shooting the, uh, the rehearsal videos, or I would be an editor for the rehearsal videos. You know, and I went to China and I shot 
I shot some action scenes for a movie there. And I was a fight coordinator in China and Thailand. And so, you know, like that, those jobs kept coming very slowly though. And it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, honestly. Um, you know, the, the, the previs world is, is hard. Previs is the, uh, is the pre-visualization uh, stage of making an action scene where you prep it all in a gym. I was in charge of doing a lot of that for some of these projects. I did that for Altered Carbon, uh, for um, Good Day to Die Hard. I did some of that for Black Panther. And, you know, I went to China again for, for, for three months and then came back and thought, I, I need to really figure out what I'm going to do because after I, after I did the China job, I, again, I had no work. And this is kind of the nature of working in stunts. That you have a job and then you're unemployed. And if you don't jump onto something else, uh, then you're just unemployed. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure I wanted to keep shooting previs and editing previs. It's a hard job. And so what what happened then was kind of funny. Uh, I say, you know, I I, I really just want to keep in shape right now. I just want to work on my technique, and I want to challenge myself. So what I did is I went in my garage. And I'd watch Tekken videos from the game. And I'd pull up the move list for the characters. And I would just look at these video game characters. And I'd just watch their move list. And I would just do the moves that they were doing in the game. But I'd do it in my garage. And I'd film myself. And I'd compare my technique with the video game character. And I put it side by side in a video, you know, showing me and the Tekken character. And I put those online. And it went super viral overnight, totally viral. The Tekken in Real Life series. Started doing Street Fighter, Dead or Alive. A buddy of mine who worked at IGN, he helped me get it onto the IGN uh, channel on YouTube. And then that got seen by millions and millions of people. And some of those people happened to work at Sony Santa Monica. And they make God of War. And they called me into audition for Kratos and God of War. Because they said, you know how to fight like a video game character. <laughs> now, in God of War, we're not throwing high kicks and, you know, we're not doing any of that martial arts stuff. But the fact that you can move like a video game character, maybe you can move like this Kratos character and Balder and a few more in this character in this in this God of War game. So they called me in, I auditioned, got the part, and that's when things changed. What did that feel like? I mean, how, how many how many years from from we'll call it the start, the impetus to that? How many years was that? That was fourteen years. Fourteen years, maybe fifteen. Yeah, yeah, fifteen years. And um, you know, I had a I had had a uh, a son recently uh, before that point in uh, uh, in uh, early twenty sixteen, <clears throat> and so yeah, this job then came in twenty sixteen, and. Uh, I didn't know what the job was. You know, they say, Hey, we're, you know, we're Santa Monica studio. We've got a game we're working on. Would you like to come in? I said, yes, yes. So I ran in, went in there down to LA. So what's, what's the character? And they said, you're playing a bearded man defending your son, which is exactly who I was at the time because I had no money. I had a wife and a kid and we were, we were not going to survive the winter, you know? And I said, I'm going to take this job. I'm going to do it better than anybody else. And that was the motion capture job that really, uh, really helped get me to where I am now. What did that feel like? What was that moment when they said yes? I, I, I think it was, it was kind of this clarifying moment that, um, you know, like a, a lot of what I, a lot of what I was doing was just blind faith. And it wasn't really belief in myself I wouldn't say that I, I'm oh, I've always been very self-critical and I've always doubted myself. I have, uh, and, and that's not healthy, but at the same time, it was never, I, I, I never put all this faith in myself because there, there's, there's just something, um, there was something else driving me and, you know, I, I'm a man of faith. I think God brought me there. I don't understand why. But I test it all the time, and 
that's a very strange trajectory that I took to end up in the motion capture world. But it all made sense because the skills that I had developed in the filmmaking and martial art world were actually much more tuned to the motion capture and game development world than Hollywood. And that was the, that was the moment where it all clicked. And I said, aha, I get this now because the motion capture process and for the, for the listeners, motion capture is where you, when you put on a, a, a suit and then they record your movements into a computer so that you can actually, so the, the game characters that you're looking at in God of War and these other games, <clears throat> uh, they move like humans because humans actually did those movements. And you can research it and you just look up motion capture. And motion capture for, uh, for video games, at least the, the, part, the playable parts, is a very mechanical process. It's actually much more tech oriented than filmmaking. It's much more tech than, than even martial arts because everything has to be so precise. And that was the stuff that, that I was always good at that wasn't always very applicable to filmmaking, but with game development, it was totally applicable. And so I've, I've thought, wow, I've really found what I'm good at. <laughs> I can do this. And uh, extremely relieving, uh, but I think that the, the, the best word for it would be clarifying. Mm. And what I find interesting about that is that when you started building these skills, motion capture, if it even existed, was research at that point. It wouldn't have been the type of thing that game studios were were using, from what I recall. Not a whole lot, you know? And, and it would have been cost prohibitive for, for most studios to have used that from, from, my, from my memory. Yeah. You know, from, you know, we're talking about that mid to, mid to late 90s. But you were doing things you were passionate about. You were building your skills. And it's something that I, I always tell people is that there is something, there's always something that when you look at the convergence of your skills, makes you, if not the best in the world, one of the best in the world. Something that you can do totally agree. that 99.5% of people wouldn't, wouldn't even be able to approach. Exactly. And yeah. so here's the intersection of that yeah. skill set for you. Yeah, exactly. Does it feel? Does it feel like that when you when you put on it, it? You put on a suit to do this, right? Yeah. The sensors are part of a suit. When you put that on, does it does it feel right? Well, the suit feels really tight and uh, <laughs> filling, and it's not it's not a very comfortable thing to wear sometimes. Sure. But when I knew, I, so here's the moment when I knew what was I I figured it out at this moment. So I was working on God of War and, um. You know, with it's hard to demonstrate this in words, but basically, when you're doing in game motion capture, uh, you have to start in an idle pose, right? So, in the video game, if you're just standing there, not touching the controller, and your character has an idle stance, right? Well, you have to, you have to match that idle stance as the performer. You have to make because they've already figured out what that idle looks like for the game. So, when you go into motion capture, the, the combat, because I went into, I was just I was just doing the stunts and the combat for Kratos. Uh, all the acting had already been done. Uh, a lot of the navigation had already been done. But I had to go in there and fill in all the combat. And so I had to make sure that I got the, foot, you know, the stance correct. I had to have the, the posture correct. So I had to match exactly what, what they had already made. So you have to start with the idle stance, right? And then for every move that you do, you have to do the right amount of anticipation before the move. You have to do... Uh, when you actually do the attack, you have to hit at the right angle, the right hitbox, they call it, to make sure that the, the move is actually going to line up with enemies in the way that they need it to. You have to hit a certain pose, which is the silhouette, when you're doing that strike, right? And that they may ask you to move your arm in a really strange way, but that, as a martial artist, doesn't make sense, right? They're asking you to throw this punch, and this other your, and so your right arm's punching your left arm, your left arm wants to go to your to your hip, or you want to bring you want to come up to your face, but they say no. It needs to come out to the side because that's what's going to look best for the game. As a martial artist, if you can't make that adjustment, then you can't give them what they need. That's extremely difficult, right? So if you're a trained martial artist going in there, you then have to modify your trained martial trained martial arts to make this character look as good as they need it to look. Otherwise, they got to fix you in post. They got to move your hand where they need to need to move it, and that costs them a lot of time. And 
They are not interested in doing that. They just want you to do it right, right there on the spot. I was able to do that. For, like I said, for whatever reason, I'm able to pick up a new habit really easily. So if they say, move your arm over here, I do it a few times and I could just do it. And then, th then you need to recover a certain way. So you go from the attack to back to the stance. There's a certain amount of time. So for a big attack, it needs to be a slow recovery. For a fast attack, it's a quick recovery. And then when you come out of that, your footwork has to be exactly the same as it was at the beginning of the shot. Now, that is a mechanical process that I think most martial artists would consider a nightmare because it's not, it's not natural. It's not how they fight. It's not the way that you actually engage in self-defense. It's just none of that stuff. It's totally mechanical and weird. And I had always, and so when they're, they're going through all this with me and I'm hit and I'm doing it exactly the way that they need it. And then at one point they, they say, okay, for this next attack, uh, we need some suggestions. Uh, how would, uh, you know, we need this axe strike. And they were asking me how, how I would move to do this certain axe strike in, uh, in God of War. And I said, I asked a very simple question. I said, where's the camera? I said, oh, it's over your right shoulder. I said, well, how about I turn my head toward the camera so that you can see my head every now and then? And they said, that's fantastic. We'll do exactly that. And, they, and so I was able to tap into how they were making the game and then bring that in the performance because the filmmaking experience that I had had was that I understood camera, editing, performance, writing, everything. I had to know all that stuff to make these to make these short films. So when it came to making the game, I would just ask the same questions. Where's the camera? You know, and for a game, usually it's locked behind you. But that would dictate a lot of the moves. And there would be other times where they would they would say, ah, oh, you know, we they would be talking amongst themselves, the uh, the directors on the mocap stage. They would say, oh, we need we need the footwork to be like this. But if the, but if his right foot is forward, then he's still gonna have to go back to idle. And they'd use all these all these words I'm trying to discuss between themselves how to make something work. And I would chime in and I would, and I would say, what if here's this move that you can actually do in martial arts that gets you back to the idol that you need? And they would go, oh, you can just do that? Like, yeah. <laughs> and it was like the language was so clear suddenly. And I could offer suggestions and I could help them develop the moves necessary to, get, to, get, to make this character work from a gameplay perspective. Hmm. And I imagine that that's you know, an element of your skill set that very few are able to bring in that makes you that much more valuable. And it makes me, in a, in a sense, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, uh, um, it's kind of a, uh, the mechanical nature of how I move a lot of the time was often the struggle. And, and I, 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 con I consider myself somewhat Aspergery, you know, and uh, never been tested, but there is a lot of, my personality that lines up with Asperger's and it was always a struggle with, you know, social, social uh, situations. And then also just kind of moving and copying people is copying people is extremely hard when you have Asperger's. Um, it's, it's actually hard to mimic people. And that's why with autism, uh, autism is, uh, is extreme aversion to mimicry. And the, the, the thing that you keep running into is that, you know, if, if I copy this person, am I being them? And then you kind of get into this weird cycle in your head. And so that was always kind of a struggle. And I knew a few other people who had that, that issue too. I even made, you know, Death Grip is about, you know, a kid with autism. And I don't play that character. It's my brother in the, uh, in the movie. Um, but then I, you know, I always considered I was like socially, you know, disabled and physically disabled in a certain respect. And uh, this was always a struggle. And then suddenly that becomes an ability. Mm. Because, you know, and, and that, that bit of information completely changes the way I think we look at the things we talked about initially. Yeah. Con kind of constructing your own reality where you have more control, where the people are following a script they're following rules did that feel more comfortable then because of that well the issues remain right because i mean with with this um difficulty with and again with with autism and asperger's it's it's not that it's hard to mimic it's that you don't want to do it so copying people uh you know dance in it's 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 across different domains, right? Like once you kind of find what you're good at, uh, and you'll find this with, with 
people with autism, once they find something they're good at, they zero in on it and they perfect it. And usually it's involving objects. Usually it's involving a computer, you know, and same with Asperger's. Uh, and this is why I went to tech first. I mean, I was a computer programmer and I really didn't want to do much else when I was 15. And I just wanted the computer to do what I needed it to do. And I focused on that and I began perfecting that. And then, you know, I don't quite have the same issue that other people have, but uh, the issue is that they can't get out of that zone anymore. And so they perfect organizing pens. They perfect collecting a certain kind of thing and they just refuse to go out of that zone. And <clears throat> so, you know, the issue always remains that, you know, once, once you get so good at something like motion capture or, or filmmaking or reviewing Hong Kong films, whatever it is, like how then, is it possible for you to take that skill set and then transfer it to another domain? And that's always the challenge. And these domains happen to be very transferable among one another. And, you know, it's not my reality. I'm just, I'm in the same world that you are, you know? And like anytime uh, I, I think that I'm making my reality, it's that I'm just trying to make things comfortable for myself. And that's not how I grew, right? The way that I grow is by getting thrown into an uncomfortable situation and having to deal with it. And that was, you know, th those, those, uh, those times when I was forced to grow, you know, like when I failed with making uh, a, a financial return with Death Grip, uh, when I was doing these films overseas and I had to work with other teams, it was very humbling experiences. And those are the times when you really grow. And, you know, and to this day, it, like now the question is, okay, now I'm really good at motion capture. How can I take that now and then go into another domain with that and keep expanding the business, right? And that's, that's always going to be the question because perfection in a given domain comes at a cost, which is that you can't transfer to another domain very easily. Now, if you happen to be in a domain that works for you, whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, working at a particle accelerator or it's organizing pens by color, right? Like you might be extremely good at one of those, but one of those isn't going to make you a paycheck, right? It's not going to support your family. So when we started, you know, we started a company called Super Alloy and we now, uh, we take motion capture and filmmaking and action design. And now we're trying to broaden the, uh, the scope of what we do to video games and film. Which seems to make sense because the lines are getting really blurry. Yeah, totally blurred now. I mean, between the two. And, and for anybody listening that doesn't, that doesn't play video games, you may not realize that the video game industry is bigger. It's bigger. Makes than the mind. film industry that we, we've... Um, what, what was it? Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 okay. on, on release day blew the doors off some records. Wasn't that, isn't that the current? Yeah. Yeah, you look at that. Mm -hmm. You look at... Um, uh, what's that one that all the kids play? Fortnite. Fortnite. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Th there was a there was a tournament in New York last week, and the winner took home three million dollars. Now this is a game that's free yeah. to play, right? People people don't. I, I'm I'm not a gamer, but I I was, and I'm not you know I have, a, I have a I have a strong passion interest in in tech. Yeah. So I follow it because it's it's popular culture. It's yeah. where a lot of things are going. So. You know, it's interesting to see how you're starting to shift. Maybe not shift, but um, how your skill set's becoming even more relevant. It's a great point. And, you know, you, you, you still see the old action film model uh, thriving, like with John Wick. Uh, you see a lot of these Korean action films coming out that are still, you know, they're old school action films. So the model is still there. The question is, as independent artists, how can we even make a dent in that? Because we thought that when 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 YouTube came around and with the um, uh, with cheap filmmaking, that everybody would be able to be making a living doing this stuff. But it turns out that there are just millions and millions and millions of people who make low budget action films that don't make a living off of it. A lot of the time, it's actually really hard. It's really hard to make a living off of making low budget films. And then with action, you just your costs triple. When you start introducing action, you got insurance, uh, you get to hire, you know, qualified performers. The world is so savvy to action now where you can't 
you can't BS your way through it. You have to do quality stuff. Otherwise people just, you know, they'll downvote you that you, you won't, you won't make the audition, whatever it is. And so now the question remains, if you're an indie studio, how do you make a killer action project? And the answer to that might be the Unreal Engine or Unity, using motion capture, using these very cost-effective pipelines now to make very good-looking renderings. You look at what Neil Blomkamp's doing, for example. He's been a huge inspiration. He's the guy that did District 9, Elysium, mm. Chappie. And he went out and he made a bunch of short films in Unity. And these are uh, partially 3D, most all 3D. You know, as Adam Short is all shot in 3D. And it, you know, it looks like it looks like a 3D rendered movie. It doesn't look real necessarily, but at this point, the the content, if the content is high enough quality, people totally give a pass to the rendering quality. Now, the rendering quality is great, but I mean, at a certain point, you you can't make it realistic. So you kind of have to live with the fact that you're your film is going to look like a cartoon in a sense. But now we can harness that because Unity and Unreal are free. You can actually make your movie in Unity and Unreal for free right now if you wanted to. And But then the question is, how do you get people, how do you get human motion into that? And with motion capture systems like Xsense, that's the one that we use, which is extremely, extremely good now. They've gotten extremely good. And the data is fantastic. I mean, it's AAA level at this point. Uh, it's like worthy of end game. And <clears throat> you can actually go and get one of these suits, record yourself, put yourself in the movie, and then you can make your movie about a guy living on Mars and it's going to cost you next to nothing. Right. Mm. And then if you can get some stunt guys putting those mocap suits on, uh, you know, you can put whatever character model you want in unity or unreal. You know, you could put anybody in the suit. And then you can have them play the same character. That's how God of War is made. I mean, there are five people who are being Kratos. So you got the voice, you got the face, you got the uh, the person doing the cinematics, and you got the you know the stunt guy doing the combat in game. Then you got the stunt guy doing the cinematics. Right? I wouldn't even do the cinematics stunts a lot of the time because I'd have to do somebody else in the, in, the, in the cinematics. So, like, and then you put whatever character you want on that movie. You got your movie. You got your action movie. You've got your 3D John Wick. As an indie studio, you can do that. Stuff. really really fascinating let's switch gears yeah. for a bit because with the sheer number of people you've connected with very talented people the travel that you've done i'm sure you've got a lot of stories a lot of things you've been exposed to that the listeners wouldn't even imagine so if i were to ask you for one of those one of those stories those anecdotes of the things that you've seen or been part of you know what might your your favorite one be what what would you share with us i think that when i did uh, the Man Who Feels No Pain in India was a monument. It was a, it was like a paradigm shift <clears throat> doing that movie. It was a huge blessing. The reason I got that job too, by the way, again, is because the director saw my YouTube channel. So he saw the rope -a dope short film that I did with Clayton. And he said, I want you to come to Bollywood and do rope -a dope And when, when you look at rope -a dope if you got, if anybody out there wants to go and watch it, it's on YouTube. It's a Hong Kong martial art action movie in America, straight up. We use all the same techniques. The fighting is dead on. It's the same thing, right? We just took the Hong Kong filmmaking system, which is the Shanghai model, and we just, we just made that short film, and it was a hit. And <clears throat> so the director said, we want you to do that in India. Now, I know that I, I've seen Bollywood films, Bollywood action films, martial art films. They're, they don't really... Uh, they're not really about performance. They're kind of about defying physics. They're about hero worship. Uh, they're about. They're not about the choreography. They're about the drama. And I said, look, that's that's not really that's really not how we make movies. You know, when you look at Rope -a Dope, the actors are doing their own stunts. The stunt guys are acting. There is no difference between the stunt man and the actor. It's the same. It's straight up like Jackie Chan, right? Jackie Chan would hire stunt guys to do the acting parts. And that's just how they made the movie. You know, the camera guy was probably a stuntman, right? Because the camera guy is following the action perfectly. They know exactly how to shoot it. You look at old Shaw Brothers movies, man. Some of those camera operators, they're with the choreography in ways that camera operator today, they, they just wouldn't be able to do it. It's impossible. You've got to actually know martial arts to follow that stuff as a camera operator. 
as I, I you know, that's that's that is a different filmmaking model than Bollywood typically uses. And, and I said, you know, you got to train your actors so that we don't have to double. I don't want to double the actors. Uh, you got to allow us to work with the camera department. Usually that's not allowed. We also need a first pass on the edit when we actually put the, when when, when the, everything's shot and done. I need to be able to take the footage, put it into an edit, do a sound design, and give it to you. You, know, you don't have to use it, but at least you can see how the flow should be based on how we shot it. Because as we're shooting it, we're figuring we know the edit as we're shooting. It. As I and, and you know the odds of that happening in Bollywood very low. But this director Hassan, he said, "Cool, we can do it." So we did it, and we went over there and. You know, in, in in India, they have uh, they have the caste system. Um, a lot of the time, actors are seen as gods. They are seen as like um, a different status than the stunt performers. But this movie, by its nature, the the director had written essentially a Hong Kong action film because in India, Hong Kong action films were huge. They've been huge for decades, longer longer than they've been huge in America, right? Like like. Hong Kong action films have been big there since the 60s. So, I mean, you look at someone like Bachan, and he embodied the martial art action star, right? Because he was a fan. You know, they took the kind of Kung Fu, uh, the Kung Fu style of, you know, the, uh, the upright Confucian type, right? The master. And it, and it worked perfectly well with the Indian yogi, right? They were the same kind of character. So they just took some of those extra movements, uh, some of those uh, Kung Fu movements and then put them into Bollywood. And so they knew the language. The thing was they didn't know how to shoot it. They didn't know how to edit it. And they didn't really know how to perform it in a way that could even compete with, with, uh, with Hong Kong and make it globally viable. It was, it was popular in India, but not really globally. And that was the challenge. And, but fortunately the actors were totally cool. They were, they were fine throwing themselves on the ground. All the stunt guys are acting, you know? And it's like, the movie, we don't hide anything. There's no doubling member. And, you know, that kind of a project is a dream come true, and it's so rare, even in America, to have that kind of a project fall into your lap like that. And that's why I jumped at it. And <clears throat> we ended up making these amazing relationships with these stunt guys and these actors. And, you know, the stunt guys would come up to me and they say, man, usually... You know, usually the stunt coordinators, they just throw us on the concrete. They don't give us pads. They hurt us. And the stunt coordinator sits there and he's, you know, he's being like a god. Uh, and I said, listen, you know, and me and Dennis, Dennis Rule, who was also in Ropado, because he, he, he came with me to do this movie. Like, we're stunt guys, too. We've just been doing it a little bit longer. And we know how to put this stuff together. And we also know how to keep you safe. So as stunt guys, we understand what it means to hit the concrete. And every time there had to be a new stunt, I would demonstrate it or Dennis would demonstrate it just to get their trust. And we'd do it right there on the concrete. They're like, that's how you do it. Now, what pads do you need? Right. And we'd put pads on them. We'd get them all safe. And, uh, in the end, you know, the movie speaks for itself. Uh, there's no doubling, you know, I think we doubled somebody maybe three or four times for some big stuff by and large though, you know, the, the actors are doing all their own fighting. You know, I challenge you to spot a double in that movie. And so that was, uh, by far one of the one of the most important or i guess life changing moments in my career when uh when we were able to bring that kind of language into india and make something like man who feels no pain hmm. you know what what i'm hearing isn't just the facts and the excitement and everything i'm hearing a lot of pride it sounds like you're very aware of the hard work that you've had to put in and the hard work that you continue to put in. And as you're talking about these other stunt stunt guys and demonstrating the movements, you know, I, I think we, we can all relate to not necessarily the stunt side, the movie side of that, but being in a martial arts school and having someone who maybe doesn't feel like they need to train anymore. They'll just tell you what to do. But the best instructors, the ones that people are follow that want to learn from, yeah, they're showing you how to do it. It it creates so much trust, so much respect to mix it up with them. I mean, I, I you know, you mentioned earlier that when I uh, when I filled out the information about this in, this interview, I put my title as student, and I know I remember now why I did that. 
because I've always been a student. And I never took a black belt because I was not ready to teach because I'm always in the process of learning. Now I understand that black belts, they still learn, right? I, I totally get that. Um, but, uh, but my whole point here is that I'm really just a student of the Hong Kong film model. And I really didn't make any of that up. I'm just taking what worked in Hong Kong that everybody seemed to love. And I'm just taking that and putting it into these other countries, right? Whether it's, you know, whether it's India, uh, Pakistan, wherever it's going to go, you know, like that model is transferable. And, you know, I, it's, it's, I don't really have pride around it because I, it's, it's not really, it's not really anything I created. I'm just taking what gifts I have and applying it to them. Like what you're saying, I have some combination. Everybody's got some combo of things, right? Everybody's got like that, that mix that makes them really a monopoly on what they do. And, you know, with, with Man Who Feels No Pain, it's that, you know, we, we're an American team. We took the Hong Kong model. Now we're putting it in Bollywood, right? And with motion capture, it's, you know, I've got this like personality trait uh, and I take that with motion capture. And then now it's like, oh, maybe now the uh, uh, people with autism actually might have a special ability in this domain, right? So maybe motion capture is actually something that's very well suited for the autistic mindset. You know, it's just a matter mm -hmm. of teaching the person with autism the moves and the way that you teach them, you know, martial artists, they, they do teach autism. <laughs> they do teach people with autism. And if you can teach them and they can drill it in and they can get it perfect, they might actually be better than most people when it comes to that thing. Wow. This, this mindset that you have, this, there's, a, there's an adaptability. You know, I mean, I, maybe it's not the right word. There's a, there's a willingness to use your skill set in a flexible way. I guess that's probably a better way to put it. That just strikes me that you could be plugged into probably any movie. You know, even if it wasn't an action movie, and still have an impact. I mean, is that? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, that's why we're um, that's why we're in games now. Okay. Because it's this. It's like a, the the uh, the model is the way I see it is very similar. You know, the, the the style of filmmaking that we were doing with the game development model, and. Uh, you know, I've, I've been plugged into big projects before and, you know, when I, I did like Mortal Kombat Legacy Season 2 and I played Striker in that and I came in, learned the choreography, I gave a little bit of input and, but as I'm doing the choreography as a performer, I'm thinking, okay, here's how you shoot it. But the thing is, I can't tell the camera guy how to shoot the, the action. I can't do it. It's just not... I'm I'm not able to, even though I have 12 years of filmmaking you know, like filmmaking experience at that point I can't talk to the camera guy and tell him how best to shoot this action he's going to shoot it however he wants to shoot it you know and <clears throat> he's shooting it in ways that I don't really agree with uh, there's some there's some stuff where you know I wish he'd shot it over here instead the I, obviously I can't control the edit so I mean you know if you plug me into certain situations I, I'm I'm not I'm not much more useful than any other stunt guy, but at the, if, if whenever we're brought in, you know, if, if, if I can come in at the beginning of, of a project and in, in the, uh, uh, at the very development stages and start crafting the action vision with the director, then I just see myself as a good translator where I can take his vision of how the action should play out. And I can carry it from that moment all the way to the end, make sure that that thing gets executed. That's all I really care about. Hmm. Let's imagine a world where a production house comes to you and says, you know what? Here's $100 million. You make the movie that you want to make. Who are you bringing in? Who's the director? Who's who's on the action, who's in the stunt team, who are the actors, what kind of a style might the film be? I What's mean, your dream movie? 
Yeah, if I, if I were given $100 million, the, the movie I make might make the investors a little bit angry because I'm probably going to go for comedy. And not many. Okay, oh, interesting. How many investors want to put $100 million into an action comedy? I could probably do it for 10, but I'll do 10 movies. How about that? No, no, I, I, I want one big one. Let's, let's yeah. pretend that the, the, investor, yeah. the investors um, just trust you completely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you can, so, you know, how to use that money aside, I would love to make an action comedy that uh, really, um, you know, what you can do nowadays is you could do the, mo the movie in motion capture, right? So I would probably do it like that. I, I might not do live action for $100 million. I might do like an Avatar style, but with comedy. Um, and uh, not with a social message. I just want to do a good action comedy. I want to do a Pink Panther, right? But do it in a future world, right? Where everything's kind of gone haywire, like an idiocracy type thing. And you bring on a great actor, someone like Jeff Goldblum. And the thing about doing everything in 3D is that Jeff Goldblum can do all his own acting scenes, and then we'll have stunt guys do the action scenes, and it'll still be his face on it, right? He could be doing, he could be cracking jokes mid-action. You know, that kind of that kind of language can be used at that point. You're not very limited by any of that. And you can create the entire world for a hundred million, man, you can make you can make an insane world, you know, with an action movie. Uh that that in you know, for the action team, I'd bring on a lot of the guys that I've used in the past. <clears throat> and uh we would, you know, we'd kill it with the action, we'd pre visit for months, we would uh make sure that action just really taps into something in the culture right now. We have to make sure that we kind of touch on whatever, whatever, wherever the audience's mind is on a global level, try and touch that. Right. And I think John Wick Parabellum touched on it, but with comedy, maybe you touch it in a different way. I don't know. I'm not, you have, we have to find that. That's what the whole process is of, of previs and actually creating the action language. And then we'd execute it. And I know we could execute it without a problem. Okay. I, I personally, I just you know love to see more comedies out there. Not many people make comedies now, unfortunately. I think. And when you think of that genre, what are what are some archetypal examples? Well, the action comedy, like Rush Hour, or Rush are you talking perfect example? Okay. You know, and but that was in what 1999, 98, and then Rush Hour two, the first one, yeah, yeah, and so it's been a long time since you've had yeah you, know, you had Rush Hour three, but um, but. There, there's, there's something about the globalization of film that I think makes investors uh, scared of doing comedy because they think that comedy has to be verbal. Comedy has to be sitcom-like. And how do you make a sitcom global? It's really hard. It's really hard. Uh, you, they're going to prefer to do something that is easier to convey, you know, some kind of epic drama like a Korean drama type thing, they would rather put their money there. But they forget the fact that Jackie Chan was making internationally successful action movies because his body told the story, right? His body was the comedy. Everybody understands that. Everybody understands physical comedy. Across the world, everybody will get it because everybody's basically the same in that way. Now, humor is going to differ, right? Verbal humor is going to differ. We all know that Germany does not laugh at American jokes a lot of the time. They have their own form of it. Japan has their own form of humor. Get that. So I think it's a matter of finding. And the, the issue is that how do you get a performer who knows who can, you know, physically do the action comedy and really translate that for the world? And that's something that Peter Sellers was gifted at. You know, he, it, it's kind of strange to consider him an action comedian, but that's basically what he was. Uh, he can physically, you know, he would subvert expectations all the time and he would just do things with the environment around him that would make anybody in any corner of the world laugh. And at this point, for some reason, investors are afraid to put money there. They'd rather put money into Marvel movies and to Star Wars and everything's about killing and everything's about vengeance now. And everything is about like, you know, disgruntled youth who just want to take out their anger on some authority figure. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of just, I, I, it's, it's kind of ugly at this point. And, um, and some of those are great films, but there is, there, it's like the release valve for comedy is, is I think it's so much more potent because 
with the uh, with the with the with the Charlie Chaplin type, the Jackie Chan type. If you are if if you portray that guy, or uh, and and you have him do things that are kind of self-deprecating and funny and physically funny things with his body, you can deliver the same kind of catharsis that the Marvel movies deliver. But the thing is that you make him very human. And then people understand what it's like to be a goofball at the same time. And they come away feeling that their hero is human just like them. Right? So the audience doesn't think like, Hey, I'm a super, they come out and they don't think I'm a superhero. No, they, they think, Hey, that character in that movie is just like me. Right. That's a, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. So that the people aren't trying to escape their world. They just find that there's somebody else in the, in that movie suffering with them. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. That was Charlie Chaplin's whole angle with little tramp is that he was showing, you know, he was the, he was the immigrant who was struggling and everybody at that time period in America felt the same way. So let's switch gears as we start to kind of wind down here. We've had some great conversation today, but I'd be remiss and probably get some hate mail if I didn't ask you for your favorite martial arts movie. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that in kind of two sp- a split question. Right. When you think of all those movies, you know, the, the 300 plus that you reviewed and all of the others, what's your favorite movie overall? And one of the questions that's come up or one of the subjects that's come up when we've had other stunt folk on the show What's your favorite fight scene? So two separate questions. So one of the uh, one of the first Jackie Chan films that I watched after I had seen Rumble in the Bronx, and uh, you know I went on this hunt to see what other Jackie Chan, Jackie Chan films were out there. I just went and I tried to find the best one, just 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 to see the best one right away. And everybody at the time said Drunken Master Two, Drunken Master Two, Drunken Master Two, best one. So I went and got the Taisang VHS of Drunken Master 2. It cost me, I think, 35 bucks at the video store. They had to order it from the East Coast. <clears throat> and when I saw Drunken Master 2, there was something, it, you know, it's, it it's still stands up probably as the greatest martial art film of all time. And there was something in my head, and I hadn't seen much at the time. I was still, you know, 16. I was young. I hadn't really reviewed many action films. But I knew when I saw that, I was like, it's not going to get much better. I know that. And I was right. Never really got much better. What is it about that film? It, there, it's, it's, it's the character. You know, it's the, uh, it's, it, so it's a, um, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it's a rite of passage movie. You know, Jackie Chan is Wong Fei Hung. He's a goofball. He doesn't train. You know, he doesn't take things seriously. He doesn't listen to his father. Right. So it's a it's this arc where he he comes around like he grows as a character right uh, that's extremely important a, a, a lot of martial art movies are you kill my master I'm gonna kill you and then the hero gets what he wants right yeah. and there's there's a little bit of growth there but not like this you know what I mean and and Jackie in the movie is not killing people to do it that's the other thing too is that he doesn't have to kill people to accomplish his his mission which is you know acquire retrieving the uh, the the Chinese artifact from the evil Westerners, right? Like that was that was the story arc. That doesn't really matter. It's really his rite of passage that matters in that movie. And you can tell that's where he that's where he is the entire time. His his, his body is showing you that the whole time and the maturity that he goes through through those fight scenes. And <clears throat> um, you know, it, it even plays out in the fact that you now Lao Garleung Lao Karleung was the co-director early on and. Uh, he's he's in, you know he's featured prominently in the early fight scenes and Jackie is kind of under him for a lot of that and that's why those f- first fight scenes in, uh, in Drunken Master Two under the train in the fish market they're they're very Shaw Brothers right it's very old school it's very kind of like holding the tradition and what happens is like last third of the movie when Jackie goes to the factory that is his stuff and like that's when it becomes jackie chan choreography and that's like the beautiful transition is like i don't think i don't think lao was involved at that point because jackie had fired him i could be wrong and i'm happy to be checked on that so don't quote me but you look at the action there and you look at the action earlier it's like night and day and it still makes a great film because the arc works and so at the end jackie is kind of taken over he's doing his own thing at that at that uh at that mill in shanghai 
and it really becomes his masterpiece at that point. And he, and he, the way that he utilizes, you know, the alcohol and the environment, and everything around him, and it doesn't just become this Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movie; it becomes a character story, and you know, like how this guy interacts with, you know, these two people that are trying to kill him, and you know how he uses the alcohol, and then how he just finishes off the whole thing. It's fantastic, and. That's where I stand on best action movie, best martial. Movie. Yeah, yeah, it's a classic, and and anybody who hasn't seen it, check it out. Definitely should check it out. That was your favorite fight scene in there too. I mean, it would be a cop out to say that. Here's here's one here's one fight scene uh, that that I love, which is uh, okay. Samuel Hong in Pedicab Driver when he fights Lao Lao Garlong again, Lao Carleon, <laughs> and uh, it's the fight in the casino where Samuel fights him. And the reason I love that fight is because that was the point. This is 1989. So Samuel had perfected editing and shooting at that point. And he had really, um, like he had really honed the craft to the point where he could do very quick. He could almost do like quick editing and keep people engaged with quick editing, but the quick editing made sense. It didn't make you, it didn't cause confusion. It was clarifying. And, you know, you, you had seen that with all of Samuel's stuff. And I think Samuel was the master editor of, you know, of all the Hong Kong choreographers. And, you know, if you were to, if you were to back up to Wheels on Meals in 1982, that end fight is that maybe that's the best fight. I'm not sure. Right. Because, again, they're, they're, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you even go back. To Bruce Lee with the Big Boss, I would, I would maybe I would say the Big Boss final fight would be one of my favorites too. Because again, you see this crazy transition. Because you look look back in time, and I, I keep jumping all over the place. But like if I had to settle on one, maybe it'd be the Big Boss final fight, which is kind of a strange one. Maybe some people might think, but here's why I pick it: because that was the movie that launched his career, and before that. You see all this footage of Bruce Lee training in his backyard and he's kicking bags and he's, he's, you know, he's, he's testing out kicks for the camera. Bruce is doing kicks that nobody else has done before. Right. And when you look at the big boss, every camera, every camera shot is so deliberate. And the, the, uh, the other choreographer on that movie was Han Ying Jie, <laughs> Han Ying Git. And Han Ying Git was an old school Kung Fu guy. He didn't choreograph the way the way that Bruce Lee did, and so when you see the two of them fight at the end, it's this. It's it looks like two choreographers battling it out. It's almost like they choreographed their own parts, and that fight is so magnetic because like the guy that wins out is Bruce because that style is what then took over in the industry, which is the high kicks because he really popularized that. Before then, nobody was doing high kicks. Nobody. Which is strange because high kicks were around in Japan and Korea for a hundred years before that, but nobody was doing it. But Bruce Lee knew how to tap in and uh, tap into you know the Korean martial art world, the Japanese martial art world. He trained with a lot of veterans in the U.S. who had brought Korean martial arts over to the U.S. You know Chuck Norris and these guys that were you know they were uh, tournament fighters and they were using kicks because they had better reach. Bruce is looking at that, going like, well, you know, even though those kicks may not work. In, in the street, they look way better than anything else we've been doing, right? And you look at Hong Kong movies up to that point, no kicks. Once Bruce Lee enters the scene, now you have kicks. Hmm. And so I, I credit the big boss final fight for, for essentially practically everything that we know about martial art cinema is due to that fight and Bruce's involvement. Awesome. Yeah, and, and another classic. And for people listening who may not have seen those movies. I mean, there's your homework. Important to understand. I mean, if you care about martial arts movies, you know, you should be watching those too. Because as you said, there's so much that comes from those films yeah. that we still see today. Absolutely. So let's, let's pull out a crystal ball. What's the future holding for you? What are your goals? What are you working towards? Well, um, what I would love is to keep building this business, you know, Super Alloy, 
uh, the, the motion capture and action design company we started and really begin to create platform to develop action design for movies, games, even live shows. And I think that, you know, this requires some research. Uh, I've been putting together a doc documentary called The Art of Violence. I'm going to try and release it by the end of the year. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about is going to be in that documentary. And what we want to do is start to kind of unravel and really dissect the, the world of, of violence and understand what it is that brings people to the, to the theater, to video games, whatever it is to engage in these, you know, these in, to engage in, in violence, cathartic violence. Um, is it, a, it, we're not trying to say whether it's a good or bad thing. We just want to know why people do it. Do people, uh, do people get addicted to this stuff? Maybe some do, maybe others don't, right? Do people react violently because they play games? Maybe some do, some don't, right? Maybe some people were violent to begin with. I think a lot of research needs to be done there, and we would like to be at the forefront of that so that we can understand how to craft action design in ways that other people don't. Um, and, I and I think, uh, you know, like you said, the, the line between games and movies is, is blurring more and more and more. And at some point, you know, Netflix is probably going to have video games. You know, I mean, you already see this with Google releasing a you know, console that's going to stream games. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that virtual filmmaking is just going to keep, uh, it's it, like, it's going to keep progressing, you know, virtual filmmaking being just doing live filmmaking, but integrating 3d into it as you're making the movie. <clears throat> and, uh, I'm really excited about that. We really want to be at the forefront of that. And I think that as long as we are keeping our finger on the pulse of the action industry and also keeping our pulse on, Keep your finger on the pulse of, you know, what's happening in the world. Like, what what crisis is happening now? Where are, are are people reacting a certain way to violence that they didn't before? You know, like it, there's probably a reason that Grand Theft Auto Three did so well when it came out a month after 9/11, because before 9/11, the games that were popular, that were the best-selling games, were all based on rules and you know tournaments and sports. You know, even even fighting games, they had rules to them. But then Grand Theft Auto 3 comes out after 9-11. You know, people portray people now are seeing violence in a totally different way. People kind of have this mass PTSD about it. They see violence as random and lawless. So Grand Theft Auto 3 comes out and that's kind of like the perfect conduit for people. You know, and so we want to understand this stuff. And we would like to do a, a lot of research on this and um, design accordingly. Fascinating. Now, if people want to find what you're doing, you know, what websites, social media, any of that, where, where can we send them? You can go to ericjacobus.com and, uh, the, uh, you know, my YouTube channel is easy to find. It's just search Eric Jacobus. Um, it's youtube.com slash Eric Jacobus official. And you can follow pretty much everything, um, just by going to our YouTube channel. And of course, we're going to link all that stuff at the show notes for somebody that might be new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So you can head on over and find that there. Excellent. This has been great. This yeah. has been awesome. And um, you've given us more of an insight into the way the stunt world works. You know, we've had a few folks on, on the show and with each of them, we get another piece. And part of my goal in doing that, because your your martial arts story is is similar, but at the same time, very different than probably the majority of people listening today. But one of the things that I love about martial arts is that it can be a vehicle, a conduit to doing so many different things. So we try to bring on people who have done many different things with their martial arts. And of course, stunts is one of them. And here we've talked about games. We've talked about so many different things just today that people may be listening to nodding their head saying, yeah, I could see myself doing that. So I appreciate you sharing all of this. Yeah, I, I love what I do, and the, uh, the, the, the entire message the whole time is that, you know, I was just a, a kid growing up in a small town, and, you know, I, it, it wasn't really, uh, it's, it's not divine, it's not like some kind of 
exceptional gift that I have. It's just I had two things that I put together, and uh, I hope that you know people can see some hope in their own lives. That uh, you know, if you have faith and you walk forward in faith, um, you know there are good things in store for you. You can probably tell that I had some fun with this one. Getting to talk to someone who took their martial arts and turned it into something that we all get to enjoy. We get to see the results of the work of the hard, hardworking stunt people, including Mr. Jacobus. And without them, where would our favorite martial arts movies be? Where would video games be? I don't think anybody would watch martial arts movies without stunt people. I don't think video games, at least a lot of the genres that are popular, would be nearly as compelling without the stunt people who are involved in the motion capture and all that. So thank you for coming on the show, telling us about what you do, how you do it, and sharing so much of yourself in the process. I appreciate your time and hope I get to talk to you soon. If you want to find out more about Mr. Jacobus or anything else regarding Whistlekick or this show, go on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Find the show notes. This is episode 422. Maybe leave a comment. Maybe follow them on social media. Maybe you want to follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Got a lot going on. We have different stuff going on on all four of those channels. So you might want to, you know, spend a little time on each. My personal email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code podcast15 gets you 15% off anything at whistlekick.com. And if that's not the way that you want to show your support, totally fine. Share an episode. Follow us on social media. Tell a friend at your training place. We don't use... Uh, style specific terms like dojo or dojang at the training hall your academy whatever you call it about what we do tell them about our show don't forget we also have products on amazon we're all over the place so find us check us out and maybe see how we can enhance your martial arts lifestyle until next time train hard smile and have a great day